Tonight you're going to talk about Robert Jackson. What did you learn in preparation for tonight? Well, it's just an amazing, amazing person. And what I love about it most is that both Warren County and Chautauqua County, these great rivals, <laughs> Warren and Jamestown, can both claim part of Jackson's legacy. Jackson was born here in Spring Creek, but then raised and, and schooled in Frisburg and Jamestown. And the most remarkable thing is how well-educated and how literate he was. And he had never gone to college as an undergrad. It was all self-taught. And I'm going to guess his family's financial situation was such that they could not afford to send him to college. And of course, in the you know, 19 aughts, um, you know, he was born in 92, so he would have been, um, you know, 19 aughts and teens, people just didn't, uh, there weren't scholarships available. Um, and he, um, you know, basically taught himself not only uh, that incredible um, eclectic knowledge that he kept throughout his life, but taught himself the law. I think he um, mentored with uh, a local Jamestown attorney and um, then went to Albany Law School. He crammed, what, two years of study into one year and passed the bar and then became one of the most prominent attorneys, not only in this part of the world, Western New York State, but in the eastern part of the United States, um, in Albany, he had met a young legislator named Franklin Roosevelt, although I think Bob Jackson actually called him Frank. Frank there could not be more than a handful of people in this world who called Franklin Delano Roosevelt Frank, but Robert Jackson was one of them. And Roosevelt had always been impressed with him. And when he was elected president, he brought him down first to serve in the Treasury Department and then later um, as Solicitor General, as Attorney General, and then as an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court, the only person in history to have served in all three of those capacities. As Solicitor General, Deputy Attorney General, and Attorney General, he argued 28 cases before the United States Supreme Court and won 27 of them. He was not only a brilliant writer, but he was a brilliant speaker, and very few people have that combination of attributes, but Bob Jackson did. And he was just one of those people who inspired confidence. Tell you, one thing I did not know about him is that FDR had him on the short list of potential presidential successors if FDR chose not to seek a third term in 1940. FDR also wanted to make Bob Jackson Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, but uh, did not have the opportunity for sort of whole series of extenuating circumstances. But <clears throat> um, amazing, amazing guy, and he clearly was the correct choice uh, of Harry Truman. This was just a few days, literally, a couple of weeks after FDR passed away in April of 1945. The Allies were preparing for the great um, war crimes trial of um, you know, the Nazi uh, henchmen around Hitler. Uh, Hitler, in fact, when Bob Jackson accepted the position as chief American prosecutor at what became the Nuremberg trials, Adolf Hitler was still alive. So was Heinrich Himmler. So was Joseph Goebbels. They had not committed suicide yet. Um, that was believe April 21st, I think Hitler committed suicide on either the last day of April or the first day of May of 1945, and then uh, Goebbels and, um, and Himmler soon thereafter. And Jackson not only had to prosecute the criminals, he had to plan the whole undertaking. It was Jackson who chose Nuremberg as the site for the trials. He chose it for a very good reason. Nuremberg had been a really central part of Nazi propaganda. It's where the great stadium was that those awful Zeke Heil rallies took place. It's where Triumph of the Will, which is one of the scariest pieces of films you'll ever see, people literally marching in lockstep to Der Fuhrer, um, all of this in connection with the 1936 Berlin Olympics, but it was all filmed in Nuremberg. Hitler so loved 
Nuremberg's role in kind of Teutonic culture that when he adopted all of the awful repressive stuff against the Jews, uh, laws that forbade them any measure of human or financial rights, he called them the Nuremberg Laws. And fortuitously for the Allies, one of the few buildings that had not been severely damaged uh, by Allied bombing in Nuremberg was the Palace of Justice. And the courtroom was in decent enough shape that with some renovation, they could turn it into a courtroom to try um, the Nazis, which they did. Uh, but it all had to be done very quickly. This was you know, the summer of 1945 that he met with the other allies at the London Conference where they adopted the principles to guide the war crimes trial and the international laws that we still abide by today. The whole thing is just extraordinary. Um, anyhow, Jackson had to not only plan the prosecution, he had to worry about getting the courtroom ready. You're wearing headphones now. Everybody in that courtroom had to wear headphones because there were Russians and French, the French and Germans, of course. It had to be all translated simultaneously. An American company called IBM did the um, translation and the whole it, it, it's remarkable in the, the translation system, which must have been incredible technology in 1945, really wasn't installed until a couple of days before the trials began. So that was sort of the level of logistical detail that Robert Jackson had to concern himself about. And the, it's really one of the truly transcendent moments in post-war America. Wow. Wow, that was very... Amazingly, and you never used an ah, uh, an um, <laughs> throughout that whole process. Well, since you guys called me a couple of months ago, I must say I have thoroughly enjoyed the research. There's a book that came out just a few years ago by the sadly now late Joseph Persico called um, Infamy on Trial, which is just a beautiful narrative history of Nuremberg. Earlier, one of Jackson's deputies, uh, Telford Taylor, wrote a very good book called Anatomy of Nuremberg. There are a dozen other books. Uh, plus some incredible magazine articles that I was able to unearth, and I, I have really enjoyed this whole process. This may be your next writing assignment. Well, I'd love to do it. It's um, I'm trying to figure out, Greg, if there is a, uh, a dimension to Nuremberg that hasn't been covered, um, but it's uh, the whole thing is incredible. It took so long. You know, they started on November 20th. 1945. They didn't finish until October of 1946. Imagine trying to do anything with the Russians, the Brits, and the French. Imagine these wily, awful uh, Nazis testifying. We had to grant the Nazis equal protection and due process and give them a chance to have all the rights that would uh, be given to anyone in the allied countries, save Russia, um, <clears throat> in any kind of criminal prosecution. So the whole thing is just remarkable. It took so long, but we finally, it finally resulted in the convictions that it needed to. 19 of the 21 defendants were convicted and 12 were hanged. Um, and it's, um, it's an incredible human drama on top of all of the legal and diplomatic and superpower uh, issues that, uh, that sort of surround the trial.